What if there were a place where you were genuinely wanted, truly accepted, and authentically loved? A place where friendships were real, support was unconditional. A place where you were heard, encouraged, empowered. A place where real faith in Jesus became a lifestyle. It's couches, porches, and kitchen tables. It's stories shared and moments worth remembering. It's hoping and praying and taking chances. It's jokes and laughter and shoulders to cry on. It's questions and answers and I don't know. It's knowing you don't have to figure it all out by yourself. It's messy and imperfect. It's giving and serving and growing better together. It's life and we weren't meant to do it. Life is better together. Join a small group today. Giving is easy and safe with our giving platform powered by Secure Give. Giving can be done from anywhere with your computer, tablet, or your mobile device. To give, simply go to the church's website, create a new account, or log in with your existing account. Simply select one time or recurring gift. Select your donation amount, enter your payment info, and then confirm your information. Visit our website and click on the giving button to learn more. Maybe you're an iOS or Android user. If so, you have an additional opportunity to streamline your giving with the free SecureGive app. Simply search SecureGive in the App Store or Google Play Market. Once downloaded, open the app and search our church name to save as your home organization. Just like with online giving, you can create a new account or use your existing SecureGive account to log in, give, and connect with us. But wait, did you also know there is now a way to participate in generosity in a way that's as easy as texting a friend? With text to give you can give using your mobile device by following these three easy steps. Number one, text the keyword and amount you'd like to give to our church's text to give number. Number two, follow the series of prompts and set up your secure give text to give account. Here, choose your desired payment method. And finally, number three, save the number as a contact in your phone for future use. Text to give only takes seconds to use and is the perfect way to connect with our ministry through giving. As you know, faith is not a destination. Faith is a journey. And some of you are pretty far along on that journey. But others of you may have a lot of questions. You may be at the very beginning of your faith journey. And the church, well, the church is the last place you'd think to speak up or ask your questions or voice your doubts. So let's change that. The starting point is where questions about God turn into conversations about faith, about your faith. It's a place where you can actually voice your doubts and explore some of the trickiest topics of faith, free from pressure and free from judgment. You see, we'd rather talk with you than at you. 
and starting point is where that happens. So if you're ready, let's talk. So, things haven't turned out as you hoped. Life took a turn. A bump. A darkened sky. And at times, it may have seemed there was no hope. But here's the good news. Our God is the God of fresh starts. Our God is the God of new beginnings. Our God brings new mercies, new compassions, not just once a year, not just when things are bad, but every single morning. This season has been tough. And for many of us, things will never be the same. But we are here, breathing, maybe smiling, or crying, or shouting, or laughing. But we are here. Feeling. Maybe fighting, or cheering, or seeking, or grieving, but we are here, living, and we are not alone. Our God is here. Our God is with us. And our God is the God of new creations.
that we have a, a God who pursues us, a God who doesn't give up on us. And uh, even when we tend to stray away sometimes, he's always there and he just wants us to, to come close. And uh, so I want you to think about, as we sing this next song, just drawing near to God and, and sitting in his presence and just um, being at his feet and laying your burdens down in front of him and allowing him, allowing his spirit to, to work in you and to speak to you tonight.
Did you feel that? Something just happened that many of us take for granted. Another year is officially in the past. A chapter is closed. And now we look ahead to a new year. The mistakes, missteps, and missed opportunities of the past give way to hope, excitement, and joy for the new life God gives us. Pursuing Christ with each new dawn. Through his grace, we get the chance to reset the clock, to forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. We know his mercies are new every morning. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, arriving at next year's end through his faithfulness. So whatever we do this year, let's give it to God, seeking his will, trusting his plan, and taking this opportunity to restart. Welcome. We are so glad you're here with us. I love seeing people in person, and it's great to have you guys all in line with us. And yes, you saw it. We are doing our, it's, we're calling it the gathering, a time to gather together and just spend some time just worshiping God. And we're going to do that in, in many different ways, including communion together. But that event is coming real soon. That's coming up in early February. And the place, you're just going to have to wait to find out. And that's what's pretty cool about it. So Mark that date on your calendar. Make sure you, you're like exit off. And some of you have friends that maybe they haven't been to church in a long time, but you know what? They would they would probably enjoy a night like that. So invite them out, and and hopefully they'll come out with you. Maybe go out to dinner, and then come out to the night of worship, and we'll be glad that you're that you're there with us. So a lot of things are happening as we're going through transitions and moves and all that kind of stuff. We're excited about it. We also got a community impact night that we're working on coming into uh, after that night of worship, which hopefully will happen in March, but you'll hear more about that as well. So some things are happening, and it's cool. So if you know of people who have some needs, we have a lot of stuff here that some of it was donated and stuff like that, and we're, we're just trying to get rid of it. So if you know that, please let us know. Say, hey, I got some friends that maybe they need a bed or they need a, um, I don't know, we got all kinds of stuff down here. So just let us know some needs, and we'll be giving you some times um, when you can come down and you can take a look at some stuff and then hopefully get out because we need to get all out of this location as we move into our, our next location. So great things. Um, if you are new to us, we are so glad that you're joining with us. And we have a gift for you. It's a book by Andy Stanley called How Good is Good Enough. And we want to get that in your hands. So please let us know. And I'll, I'll get this right out to you as soon as we can. And thanks for joining with us. If you'd like to give to this ministry, we greatly appreciate it. There's a lot of expenses with the move. There's expenses with where we need to update our website and all that kind of stuff and, and cool stuff happening, as well as these events that we're now going to be doing out in the community, not in a building that's ours. We're doing it out there. And so that's, that's more expense, but a great expense because it is just great to be part of what's going on in the, in the Binghamton area, in the greater Binghamton area. So thanks for your support. We really appreciate it. And, and if, you, if you'd like to give, it's easy to do that online. There's a link to the online. Our online church has a link right there. Or if you're on YouTube, it's easy to click on that link as well. So thank you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this time together. A time to just set aside in our day where we just want to put you first for a while. So Lord, as, as, we, as we gather here, may may help us to let go of the things that are on our heart and minds that are weighing heavy right now. May we just place them in your hands. May you allow us to open up our minds and our hearts to you, to, for you to speak. Help us to hear what you need to say to us right now, to each one of us individually. Maybe something going on in our lives that, Lord, we're, not, we're missing it. We're not seeing it. 
and other people around us see it and and they need us to see it so would you help expose that to us maybe there's a different way to do something we're trying to do maybe we're just trying too hard and, and there's another simpler solution that we haven't found So, Lord, open up our minds to hear your voice, that you may guide and direct us. And, Lord, as we continue in this series, may, may you help us to take seriously just you as God and what you've called us to do. Thank you, Lord, for this ministry of North Point Church. For the opportunities that lay before us are so great. And in the midst of, of the fear of the unknown and the change and the challenges, may you bring excitement to our hearts of what you can do because you're a God. So thank you so much for this opportunity we have together. And may you just bless it in amazing ways. May you challenge us in amazing ways. And may we just see more people come to know your son, Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen. So if you could meet somebody famous, who would that be? Who comes to mind? Maybe it's somebody that you followed our sports team, or maybe it's a movie star or a, you know, a singer or some other kind of artist. Uh, maybe it's an author or I don't know, so, you know somebody that you, you admire, somebody that you're like, wow, I'd really, like it'd be cool to meet them someday. You know, I know I've met some People I thought were in my life were like, oh man, I can't wait to meet them someday. And if I meet them, that'd be pretty cool. And I got to meet them. And what what if you what if you could actually um, not just get a chance to meet them, but what if you could get a chance to maybe um, talk with them for a little while? Like maybe it's not just like a hi, you know, I'm Kenny and they're whoever, and, and then you walk away. But maybe it's like you know, you get to go for a cup of coffee together. Or maybe go out to have a long dinner. Let me ask you this. If you got that opportunity, would you know them? Would you know them? It's an interesting word, the word know. And it, and it has a wide meaning because we use it in all different kinds of forms. I mean, like, you know, if somebody asks you, hey, my car broke down. Do you know a mechanic? Yeah, I know a mechanic. And, and you don't know. You sure? I know him. I mean, I know a mechanic. We, we, we've had the same mechanic for, uh, I don't know, 35 plus years. And uh, he's a great guy. And if I remember correctly, his two daughters, one just got married about the same time our daughter did. And we were chatting about that one time. And, and you know, you know it's great to see him. It's like, you know, I mean, it's like I almost reach out and hug the guy when I see him because he's just a cool guy, you know. Um, but I don't know him. Like, I, I don't know him. Like, I mean, I know a little, but, like, I don't know him. Remember when you first went out on a date with somebody? Now, for some of you, that may have been a long, long time ago. But, you know, you go out on a date, and, and, and you know, one, one of the first things you do is you're, you're trying to figure out this person. You know, is it somebody that you may like or somebody that you may have some interest, commonality in, you know? You're trying to get to know them, right? And hopefully, if, if you were, were dating or dating for a while, you get to know them because you've had some very long conversations. I know back in the day, you know, um, you know, a lot of my relationships started out because we would connect, we'd start to talk, and then we'd spend long hours talking, and then next thing you know, you know, I mean, I still remember with my wife, Julie, you know, I think it was like 2 o'clock in the morning we were up talking, and then all of a sudden... I don't know who kissed who, but, you know, it just changed everything, you know, because we wanted to get to know each other, right? 
If you're dating someone, or if you've been dating for a while, sometimes you get into that relationship thing where, you know, you're getting to know each other a little bit, and then usually the, the woman or the girl will ask the question because um, they're feeling it, and they say, you know, we, we need to talk about our relationship, right? And uh, can we have the talk? Can we talk about our relationship? You know, and, and usually, I'm not trying to, you know, stereotype, but let's just face it, you know, usually it's the girls, because guys are like, well, what do we need to talk about? Like, it's good, right? I mean, everything's fine, right? Why talk, right? Well, maybe because something is not working. Maybe something is not in sync. Maybe something's wrong. Maybe you did something wrong or they felt like they did something wrong. And so you want to talk about it. And, but, you know, what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out, okay, you know, because if you're younger, you're, you're trying to figure out, okay, if this is a person, if I, if I want to get married, want to have kids or something like that, have a family, then is this a person who wants those same things? And you're trying to figure out that. So where's our relationship going, you know? Is this leading to marriage? And you sort of want to figure that out because you don't want five years to go by and then figure out, oh, that's not what they wanted, and then you got to start all over again. You want to know that going in, right? Why is she asking this or he asking this? Because it's in our wiring. I mean, it's just how we were made. We, we, we were made for, for more in relationships than just the hi, how are you kind of thing. We were created for intimacy. That's how God created us. He created us to be closer to one another. It was the part of the creation of man. Now, we mess this up, okay? We do, and we all mess this up. But, and then we create this false sense of intimacy, and we're really good at that, right? Instead of getting closer, then it gets us further away from each other. Because when you try to substitute real intimacy for false intimacy, what it does is it causes a mess. And then instead of creating intimacy, it actually pushes and, and, and just, oh, it's a mess, right? But intimacy, it's, it's how we're wired. And so today, what I want to talk to you about, okay, and I want to ask you this from God's perspective is, where's our relationship? Where is it? Last week, we began a new series, and, and we started talking about how Jesus, and he's a, he was a master at this, right? You know, he'd come along and, and, and he created this curiosity among people and frustration among others. But he created this curiosity where people wanted to, they wanted to come and, come and see. They wanted to come and check him out. That's what he did, right? And, and, that's, and that's what some people did. They came and they were, they were like, oh man, you know, the, Jesus is talking again. Today. Let's go watch Jesus, you know. Let's go see him perform a miracle. But then after a time, Jesus would then go a little deeper. And he challenged you, and he said, okay, uh, I got to ask you, you know, I, I know you've been coming to see him, and that's great, and all that kind of stuff, but I'm going to ask you, and he asks a very important ask. So welcome back to our series, and we are in a series called Take Five, and I hope you've been taking the Take Five Challenge, and I proposed this back on, on New Year's, and the Take Five Challenge is this, five minutes in, in the Word of God, and I, I recommend you start in the New Testament, and then five minutes in prayer. And to do that every day, okay? And this isn't something where you're like, oh, no, I missed another day. I don't want you to do that. I just want you I, I, you know, commit to, hey, I can do 10 minutes. Now, some of you do much more than that. That's awesome. But for some of you, this is a great start, okay? So take the Take 5 Challenge. And in this series, what we're talking about is five essentials that are, are critical if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. It's just, it, it's just that's what it is. That's the way it is. And, and these are things I've learned. I, I'm passing on to you, okay? One of the, the guys who influenced me the most, most recently was a guy named Dwight Smith. And uh, he had just like how he, he put it all together. And I was like, wow, this is cool. But these are, these are probably not new things, but they really are essentials to what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus asked those who were coming out to seeing, who those who were listening, he says, do, do you want to follow me? Right? And if you, if you follow me, if you follow me, I'll give you light. I will take you out of the darkness. But if you follow me, you've got to be willing to carry your cross. And so if you, if you, if you want to follow, you, you better count the cost before you come follow me because it's a high cost. And what he does is he takes the relationship to a whole new level. And that's what I want to do today is I want to ask you, where is our relationship and where do you see it going? Now, not ours, but yours and God's. Where, where is it? And then where do you see it going? Now, if you're at the come and see phase, and you're like, you know what? I, 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 love, I love 
hearing about God. I love reading the stories. I'm excited about that. That is such a cool phase. And I, I invite you to keep coming, keep seeing, because, you know, God wants you to do that. He wants you to explore. And some, for some people, that's a long journey. And if this is where you are, that's okay. And, and the last thing I want to do is, is make you feel like, okay, you're like on this first date with God and, and we're, we're talking about like I'm naming our kids, okay? Because that's just, that would be weird, right? So take your time. But what I want to do is I want to talk to those of you who are a little bit further along in what you would say, your relationship with God. To those who are past the few dates, okay? And, and it's a little bit more serious. And what I want to do is I want to focus on this word, No. What does it mean to know? I mean, do, do you know, like, your coworkers? I mean, you probably know their name because you see them every day. Maybe you know one or two of their kids, or maybe all their kids, or maybe you know their spouse's name, maybe you know their background. But do you know them? Do you know your boss? Do you know your friends? Do you know your spouse? Or your brother or sister? What does it mean to know? And if you say, yes, yeah, I know them, well, what does that mean? Is that just casual? Is it more? In the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew word for no was, was yada. Okay, not yoda, it was yada. And, and it's, it's much different than how we use the word today. Um, look, how, look how it's used, okay? I want you to see how this, this is back in Genesis. It says, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Okay, now that's not a casual no, is it, Right? That's intimacy. The Hebrew word for no, it, it had with it a sexual knowledge. That's what the word, that's the word entails. And, and it was, it's, it's the husband and wife in the most intimate relationship possible. In the garden, Adam and Eve were naked. They felt no shame. That was intimacy. That they totally were exposed. Not just not naked, but they were totally exposed. They totally knew each other. And they felt no shame. And that relationship with God was the same way. It was totally open. It was amazing. And this relationship, the husband-wife, is the exact relationship that God chose to describe his relationship of his son with the church. That he is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. That's powerful. Especially when you take into context this no. Because we are created for intimacy with God. That's how God wired us. We're created for intimacy with God. Go ahead, show, the next slide. It was experienced in the garden, the intimacy, and then it was broken in the garden. That's what happened, broke. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, okay? And most of you know this, right? And it broke that intimacy. It was, it was done, it was gone. And the relationship they once had with God was different. And the relationship they once had with each other was now different. It was broke. And since that time, man tries to fix it. And that's what every religion in the world is all about. We try to fix this thing that's broken with God, hoping that somehow we could figure out how to fix it, right? That's what makes Christianity so different. Because Jesus, Jesus came and he's different. Why is he different from anybody else? Because he went to the cross. And the cross fixed it. Now Jesus is about to go to the cross. And he's talking to his disciples. And so it's that intimate moment. And it really is an intimate moment. And if you read this, in, uh, one of the most, the best account to read really is in John. Because John goes into great detail in his gospel about what happens in that moment that they're having supper together. But Jesus is just talking to them. And, and he's just pouring out his heart to them. And, and he's saying, he's like, wow, you know. And so here he's about to go to the cross, and, and he's praying for his disciples, but he's also praying, believe it or not, right, in that whole passage of prayer, he's praying for you and me, because he prays for those who have not yet heard, which would have been you and me at that time, right? And then he says this as he's praying. He says, Father, the hour has come to glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Jesus being the son of God, being God, has authority to literally to give life. That's in his, his possession. 
Whether you live or not, that's in his authority to give you or not to give to you. Okay? How? Listen. He said, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And there it is, to, to know. Eternal life comes from knowing the Father. The relationship has been broken. It's only fixed by Jesus. And that's the only thing that can fix it so that we can know the Father. Without Jesus, you can't know the Father. It's impossible. But Jesus came that we may know the Father. Peter put it like this. He said, salvation comes no other way, no other name, or has been given to us by which we must be saved. Only this one, this is it. What is so critical to grasp here is our mess separates us from God, okay? And then Jesus fixes that. Because through the cross and through the resurrection, he builds the bridge back to God so that we can, as Jesus put it in his own words, so that we can know the Father. And Jesus calls us to a choice to say, do you want to know the Father? And if you want to know the Father, then you have to make a choice. You have to make a decision. And we make that choice, and our faith is based on a decision that I understand the cross, I believe what Jesus did on the cross, and I believe in the resurrection, and therefore, we literally cross the bridge. God made him who had no sin, Jesus Christ, to become sin for us, so that in God's eyes, he sees us as now righteous. We are, have the ability to cross over. And so this dating time, where, where it goes from coming and seeing and coming and seeing and coming and seeing, it comes to a point of engagement, where it's like, oh, you're asking me to commit to you. You're asking me to make a decision for you. Yes. Now, it's not a marriage yet because it just, that's, that's yet to come. But in, in the Hebrew culture, the engagement was just as binding as just as committing as a marriage. And that's what, that's what that commitment does. It, it's that point where we say, okay, now we're engaged. And that, engage, that, that engagement time, that commitment time, it's not a one-way ticket to heaven, okay? You, you get there, okay? It's not, a li it's not a now life is better, okay? It, it does. I, I think life is better following Jesus, right? But it's, it's the whole intent, Jesus said, was so that you may know the Father. I came to reveal the Father, and I want you, he wants you to know him, and the only way to know him is by faith in Jesus Christ. So forget everything else for a moment. Forget everything you, you ever knew about Christianity and all that stuff. All the stuff of life, forget the, the, you know, all the religion stuff, the church stuff, the singing, the, the serving, all that. Just forget that. We are called to know God. That's it. Now some of that's a reflection, all the rest is a reflection of it, but we are called to know God. Because if we don't know God, how can we represent God to the world? If we're not growing in a relationship with God, how can we represent him to the world? To know God requires intimacy. We crave it. That's how God wired us. He wired us to crave it because he wants us to be intimate with him. The struggle is, and... and <laughs> This is where the whole mess up comes, okay? Because we are broken, we fear intimacy. Because what if I share that and they don't take it the right way? What if I share that and they share that with somebody else? And so we, we are designed and created for intimacy with the Father. Jesus came so that we could be intimate with the Father. And yet, we struggle with being intimate because it scares us. And so we substitute things. Now we substitute bad things, and that's easy to figure out, okay? But we also substitute good things. Because it's easy to substitute good things if it still keeps me from getting too close to the Father. Because the Father reveals. The Father reveals who we are, where we're at. And that's scary. And so, it's easy to start doing things 
that are bad, and it's easy to start doing things that are good, but keep us from intimacy with God. One of the scariest verses, I think it's the scariest verse in the Bible. Okay, take the whole thing, beginning to end. This verse scares me the most. Now, maybe you've read it. Maybe it scares you too. But when I read this verse, I'm like, oh my. Jesus is speaking. And this is actually earlier on in his ministry. He throws this one out. I think a lot of times we think, you know, Jesus played it easy a lot of times. But he was really like in, in, in their face. And he's talking to the crowd. He said, look, you're not allowed to judge people, right? He said, don't, don't look at, you know, don't, don't try to take the, you know, take the speck out of your brother's eye when you got this big plank in your own, okay? First take the plank out of your own, then you can help your brother. And then he talks about asking the father. He says, you know, if you want, if you want things, don't be afraid to ask. Ask. He wants to give you good gifts. And then he starts talking about entering through a narrow gate. Well, what do we mean a narrow gate? Don't we all like go to heaven? No, he says, there's a narrow gate. And there's few who find it. Like, wait a minute. I thought like we're all going. The whole crowd's listening. All no, there's a narrow gate. Few find it. And then he starts telling. He says, watch out for false prophets because there's a lot of them out there and they're going to tell you all kinds of other things, right? So watch. How do you know they're a false prophet? Watch their fruit. Because bad trees will not produce good fruit. And good trees won't produce bad fruit. You just watch their fruit. And then he says this, and this is the scariest verse to me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And many will say to me on that day, I mean the day of judgment, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name did we not drive out demons? And in your name did we not perform any miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And there it is. Why did Jesus come? To reveal the Father. He came so that we could know the Father. Without him, we, we're, we're, we're stuck in a place where we can never know the Father. But now that he has come, we can know the Father. That's scary, isn't it? That God would say, I don't know you. But we met. And he might say, is that, I, I remember meeting. We, we had like a good conversation because he remembers everything. He's God, you know. I remember having a cup of coffee with you. That was great. That was awesome. We went out to dinner for a while. But you don't know me. We just went through that stuff. I never got to know you. That's scary, isn't it? Listen to the way the message translates it. Now this is a transliteration, but I just thought it's a little bit more modern language. Listen, listen to how he puts it. So just knowing the correct password, like this, saying master, master, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. What is required is serious obedience, doing what the Father wills. I can see it now at the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, we preached the message. We bashed the demons. Our super spiritual projects had everyone talking about them, right? And you know what I will say? You missed the boat. All you did was use me to get yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. What happened? Went to church. Man, they, they like went to Billy Graham, you know, and hopefully some of you know who Billy Graham is, you know. They even walked an aisle. But they missed the mark because they didn't know Jesus. And those who walk that walk are not only dangerous to themselves because we think we're in a place we're not, but you're dangerous to the church. You know, spiritual discovery is exciting. I, I man, I can, I, I, rem I just remember, I, I remember exploring, you know, I, I was curious about spiritual things ever since I was a little kid, and I remember there's a long period before I finally understood what Jesus Christ had done. And, and I can tell you stories after stories after stories about that journey, right? It was an exciting time. But when you choose to trust in Jesus Christ, Five essential values. 
Five essential things mark you as one who is following Jesus Christ. They mark your journey. And they're essential. You can't, you can't, like, you can't have one without the other. You can't take away one and say, well, that one's not important. They're, they're, they're essential. They're all throughout the New Testament. Five things. The first one is developing intimacy with God. The first one. Now, I told you, don't you serious? You're going to know this, okay? So the first one, very easy, intimacy. If you don't remember anything else, just remember that, okay? Intimacy. It's one of the five critical elements of a follower of Jesus Christ. Perfect? No. Mess up? Yes, right? But I chose to seek God. I chose to make a decision to know the Father. I can know the Father through Jesus. Now, I know it's easier. It's like, you know, just give me a list of things I should do, things I shouldn't do, you know, and, and, and that's easy, you know, but it's not. That's not what it's about. It's about, am I seeking to grow in intimacy with God? And that takes time. It takes time. There's no other way to do it. And it never ends. Never ends, because he's... he's He's too big. I mean, I'm a firm believer, and I have no, like, verse that can pinpoint this, okay? I just think the whole, all the scripture points to it, that, that we will spend literally all of eternity trying to know God because he is just so vast. That's exciting. It can't happen quick. Growing in intimacy takes time. It never ends. It, it continues now. No, continue. In, it'll, it, it begins now. It continues into heaven. If it's, if it's not happening now, if we're not developing an intimacy with God, then what makes us think we're going to do it later? And I really think that's what Jesus is talking about. You can't think that if you're, if you're not doing something now, all of a sudden when you die and you have to face God, all of a sudden it's going, okay, now I can kick it into gear. The word developing is an interesting word because we don't use it anymore, okay? Because it's an old word and it goes back a ways, right? Um, years ago, it was a familiar word because it was used as a, as a technical term, okay? It was used in the processing. It's, it's the process, this is literally a de definition, the process of treating a photographic film with chemicals to make the, the, the image visible. And if you've ever done this in a dark room, so this is wild because once the, the photograph, the, the paper, the special paper, is exposed to the negative, right, in a dark space, right, and then you put it in the chemical and then slowly the image starts to, to come into focus. Now maybe you've seen this in movies, but it's a really cool process. But it's a process that takes time, and as the photo takes time, the image becomes more and more clearer. The more we follow Jesus, the more Jesus shows the more the image comes clearer. Jesus told us, he said, one of the greatest commandments, the greatest commandment is this, right? Love the Lord your God with all your, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. First and greatest, the highest priority in life is to love God. How do we do that? By developing intimacy with him. It's not a one-time event. It's a constant desire to know God. It's a constant desire to be moving in our lives to know God more and better. It's not a set of to-dos or, or not to-dos. It's not, you know, I went to church, check that. I, I read my Bible, check that. I did this, check that. It's not that. I mean, can you imagine having a relationship with your spouse? We're like, okay, I came home, I asked you how your day was, check. I kissed you on the cheek, check. Okay, we're, we're good, right? We're intimate, right? No, it doesn't work that way, does it? No, it takes time. It takes deep conversation. It takes, it takes being real with your spouse. If you want a friend that you're really close to, guess what? It takes exposing your fears and your struggles. And when we do that with somebody and they reciprocate that, then the relationship takes on a whole new meaning because it becomes more intimate. And guess what? That's where closeness, that's where closeness comes from. We can't come to a prayer where it's like, you know what? Yeah, I got married and yeah, man, I don't know the last time we even talked to each other. Like, you know, we, we, yeah, we were married a long time ago. And it, it just, it, it won't be that way. You'd be like, well, you're not really married then. You're like, I know it's on a piece of paper, but it's, it's a continual process. If we love him, we are developing intimacy with God. 
Now, what I want to do is just give you a few things, okay, as we wrap up. A few things to help you to develop intimacy with God. First is time in the Word. No substitute. You, you can't know God unless you read what he wrote, okay? And so you have to spend time in the Word. Um, will it scare us? Yes. <laughs> the Word of God is so uh, amazing because, it, and this is why I think sometimes we avoid it, because, or we just read it to read it, because it exposes us. I mean, it's, it's such good stuff, but it, but it cuts through us. And, it, and, it's, and it's easier not to do it. It's easier just to do this stuff, you know, go to church, I'll sing a few songs, throw on the radio. It, it's easier to do that stuff than it is to really dig into what God is doing. When, when the early church, when, when, when the Jewish people heard the message from the disciples, you know, Jesus had gone into heaven, okay, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They go out and they start telling what will happen. You know, that Jesus came and, you know, and Peter does a great job. He's like, and, and he tells them, you know, this Jesus who came to die for you, you killed him, okay? And now you, you got to repent. And guess what they did? When they heard the word of God through the voice of Peter, they repented. It, it cut them to the chase. It just, they had to do something about it. That's what the word of God does. Because the word of God, what it does is it invites us literally into the presence of God. That's what Hebrews 12 is all about. It, or Hebrews 4.12. It's, it's all about you are invited to the throne of God. Wow. And the word tells us who he is. It, it, it exposes who we are. I mean, John looked at Jesus and said, the word became flesh. That's who Jesus is, is the word, the living word of God. The word exposes me like a double-edged sword. I, I, and that, that's hard because the truth cuts through, right? And regular exposure to the word of God is my daily food. It, it's, it's what I need to depend on. But the word alone won't do it. There's going to be another thing you need to do, and that's this. It, it takes silence and it takes solitude. Because exposing ourselves to the Word of God without creating the environment for God to speak, it'll just stay there. And then we learn a lot about God, but it's never changed us. So it's time to turn off the music and turn off the, the, the noise and the radio and, and just and put your cell phone on silence and put it in the other room and, and it's just taking time with God. Now, music can help. And there's times of solitude, sometimes just the worshipful music in the background, but not all the time. Because sometimes it'll just focus us that way instead of focus on what is God trying to tell us? What is he talking about? You know, the psalmist wrote, be still and know that I am God. It's in solitude that, that we are able to set aside our fears and know that God is there, that we are not alone. He is there, he is with us, and he will never forsake us, never leave us. And then in that place where we're alone with God, where we're learning to know the Father, comes the place of submission. Where I say, okay, oh my goodness, this, this is, I messed up. And the more it comes with God, the more it starts to come with other people. We're like, you know what? I messed up. Man, I'm sorry I got so angry. Man, I just... I didn't mean to say that. that. It just, that becomes more part of who we are because we've spent more time with God. Submitting to God is a great, great commission. That's what we were, we were, we were called to go tell the world, right? Go and tell the world and teach them to what? Obey everything I commanded. Now, there's more to it than that, but so if we're teaching others to obey, then it has to start with us, doesn't it? Word, silence, and solitude, submission. It's developing intimacy with God because I want to know God. I want to know God. God knows us, right? He says, I know every hair on your head, right? Or the hairs that used to be there, okay? I know them. But I want you to know me. I want you to know who I am. Intimacy. It's the first, right? First one of five critical elements, okay? We are to know God and we are to make him known. That's what we're called to do, to know God and to make him known. And you're like, wait a minute, there's another part of this? Absolutely, there's another part. There's actually five, right? Intimacy, and next week we'll talk about the next one. <laughs> so don't miss next week as we go on with take five, and I hope you'll be here. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for, Lord, thank you for what you did. Um, Thanks for going to the cross. 
You fixed it. You fixed what was so badly broken. And you give us the opportunity to fix it in our own lives. So Lord, may, may we be challenged in, in what that means to us. May we really look at where, where is our relationship heading with you? And where do we want it to go? May we never be insecure in, in our faith and our decision to follow you. May we become more secure knowing that, that we are your child, that you've called us, and may you help us to, to want to seek you more, to know you more. Lord, for those who are in, in that phase where they're just coming to see, May you make it exciting for them. May you bring people into their lives who are, are willing to let them explore and to ask questions. May you deepen their, their drive to, to know more. But may you especially lead them to the place where they, they commit their lives to you. They get engaged. They they placed their faith in your son, Jesus Christ. But Lord, what I'm asking today as we get into these five elements that you help that excitement that we had before we gave our lives to you not end, but increase. That's just the beginning. It's the beginning of our lives together with you. So Lord, help us to put everything else aside and, and just realize that you have called us to know you. And because of Jesus Christ, we can do that. So Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ, your son. Thank you that you are there as our father. And give us the desire to know you. And help us to put into place the things in our lives that will help us to develop that intimacy with you, our God. We ask this through Jesus Christ. Amen.